Hello and welcome to episode 200. Yes, 200 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan, as always, joined by Evan Silva. We thought about doing something special for episode 200. We decided that was corny, and so we are not. Evan, how's it going today, buddy? It's going good. It's going good. You know, I, I, I told you that I, I had to get out of here, um, you know, within like 30 minutes to go pick up my kid from camp, but um, I really just got to go out back and uh, finish up some yard work. <laughs> uh, so, you know, let's, let's make it snappy. All right. <laughs> On today's show, we are going to be going through some news. There's been some coach speak that I think we need to evaluate whether it's real or not. There's been some depth chart reporting that I think we need to discuss. And then we're also going to talk about a couple rankings changes Evan has made in his top 150, which got a clean sweep, I believe, last Thursday. Before we get into that, I wanted to remind everyone this show is, of course, brought to you by our friends at Underdog Fantasy best way to get ready for the DFS season, aka the best season, is to be in the real money, best ball streets. Underdog does indeed have the best platform to do so. If you have the draft kit, if you have the bundle, you get 10 free dollars. And if you're a new user on Underdog, you get 35 free dollars. Okay. This Jet stuff, Evan, we alluded to it last episode a little bit. I want to start with Denzel Mims, exclusive, exclusive second string. Listen, man, coaches did not draft Denzel Mims. Joe Douglas did. I understand that. But these coaches did not draft Denzel Mims. These coaches did give the green light on Keelan Cole, 5.5 million. These coaches did give the green light on Corey Davis, 37.5 million. These coaches did give the green light on the 34th overall pick on Elijah Moore. These coaches did convince Jamison Crowder. They didn't just say, hey, we're going to cut you. They said, hey, get a pay cut and you'll be back. And so there's a lot of things that make me think Denzel Mims, despite his seemingly on-field talent. I didn't love the way he played last year. I don't think a lot of that was on him, but still, I think that this coaching staff might just be like, he's not the type of wide receiver that we want. If I had to project today, the top three Jets wide receivers, it would be the three guys that I said. It would be Cole, Corey Davis, and Elijah Moore. So how are you digesting all this stuff coming out of the Jets camp at wide receiver? Yeah, and I, I, my guess would be that it's actually uh, it's going to be Elijah Moore as like the um, the Z receiver, mm-hmm. and Jamison Crowder as the slot receiver, mm-hmm. and um, Corey Davis and Corey as Davis, like yeah. the 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 perimeter receiver, and then Keelan Cole as the four because he can play like all the all the all the positions. Yeah, and then Denzel Mims actually as the five. And but but at the same time, I would have a concern that they might just end up, especially early in the season, they end up playing all five guys that all got all five guys see action. And that, yeah. you know, prevents anybody from having like even eight target games and the targets just get really spread around and they're throwing the ball to Michael Carter and, you know, Chris Herndon uh, gets a little bit, too. And um, so that would be my early season concern. But um yeah, I think I think it's going to be Corey Davis, Jamison Crowder in the slot, and then Elijah Moore playing outside. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that makes a lot of sense for sure as well. I would say um, that people are probably thinking, oh, it's the Jets. Who cares? As we alluded to, as Evan said last episode, Zach Wilson is going to be fantasy friendly. Like people who haven't watched Zach Wilson play, he is going to play aggressively vertical, throw the ball when guys are covered. He's going to run and scramble around a little bit. Like I think that the Jets offense is going to have way more upside than people think. You can scroll back to the last episode to read more about that very good offensive line as well. So yeah, I mean, look, I I think Denzel Mims in our dynasty rankings, we knocked him down a bunch. We've been knocking him down in the rankings as well. I think that it's, it's time for Denzel Mims, maybe through no fault of his own, but yeah, it's time to knock down Denzel Mims for sure. I think. Yeah. It's just, I just, I think his skill set, as we mentioned on the last show, his skill set, is not like a perfect fit for what Mike LaFleur is going to want to do. And that's get the ball into his playmaker's hands and let him run after catch and create, um, you know, comfortable high percentage situations for their rookie quarterback. Okay. Next news topic I want to talk about is this Vikings tight end stuff. And I tweeted about this, I don't know, maybe a few weeks ago from an article in ESPN. It was about Irv Smith's breakout, but in there was a quote from Mike Zimmer. And let me read you the quote. It said, uh, basically, the the article said Mike Zimmer doesn't expect Irv Smith's role to be much different now that Kyle Rudolph is gone. And the quote was, I think it's a bigger role for Tyler Conklin, said Zimmer. He's kind of emerged as a guy that's moving upward. And with those two guys, we have a lot of weapons there. Before you completely brush this off, I want to say Tyler Conklin is a very good athlete. I want to say that in the four games that Kyle Rudolph missed last year, Irv Smith saw 20 targets. 
Tyler Conklin saw 21. In the four games Kyle Rudolph missed last year, snaps were 204 versus 203. Although Irv was coming off an injury in that first game and was kind of eased back in. So I don't think it's completely meritless. I do think Irv Smith, as a former first round pick, obviously has the leg up, obviously is more likely to break out. But I don't want to just completely brush this off as total coach speed. What do you think about the Vikings tight end after hearing this Mike Zimmer stuff? Yeah, I think it's kind of just Mike Zimmer being like a crank a little bit. Uh, But at the same time, I do think that they like Tyler Conklin. um, And I think that they should, he can block, he can, he's a, you know, solid possession receiver. As you mentioned, he was a, he's a good athlete. He had pretty good production uh, during his college career. He's been a guy that I've kind of like tried to stash in in some, on some deep dynasty rosters over the years, just because I kind of believed in him uh, as a talent. Now he's going to get his opportunity. I think he's draftable in like um, uh, tight end premium leagues and, uh, maybe, you know, but like in the Scott Fish Bowl, he'll, you, he'll, he'll probably be, you know, rostered. Um, and I do think he's going to take a big chunk of that Kyle Rudolph role. But, you know, when Kyle Rudolph missed time last year, Conklin did obviously see a, a big bump in playing time, but Irv Smith saw a bump in playing time too. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that he's going to continue to be, I think he's going to continue to ascend. You know, this is a player who came out of college, um, out of Alabama, very, very young. And has really, when he's gotten his opportunities, I mean, he has really flashed. Yeah. And I don't see any reason th- that that his role wouldn't expand. I I get it to Mike Zimmer. You know, Clint Kubiak is the guy who's running the offense now. And um, Clint Kubiak is like a young guy. And I, I think that he's going to uh, be a little bit more progressive than his dad was. And I think we're going to see Irv Smith out there a, a lot this year. And I, I, I would kind of ignore that, that coach speak. Okay. Yeah. We'll talk more about the tight end tiers here in a second when we get to rankings changes. Another interesting kind of, and I hate beat writer speculation, but I thought this one was somewhat notable and maybe because it aligns with what we think. And so it's confirmation bias season, but Ryan O'Halloran, who we used to know from the Jaguars beat now covers the Broncos. His, this was uh, Ryan O'Halloran speculation on the running back situation on Javante Williams. He said, I think Javante is the week one starter. You do not trade up in the second round for that position without having him earmarked to be your main guy. Melvin Gordon has been a complete no-show during OTAs. If they thought he was still the starter, I believe he would have made an appearance or two. The market's reacted here, Evan. Javante is up to 62nd overall in ADP on underdog. Melvin is at 91st. Over, Actually, I believe that's your top 150. But the the those are your top 150 ranks. Javante, 62nd, Melvin, 91st. But the ADP is kind of correlating there as well, although not as in such an extreme it's confirmation by a season because we kind of think Javante is the far better pick than Melvin Gordon, but I think it's at least some merit. We like Ryan O'Halloran, I think, as a beat writer. What do you think about his speculation about Javante versus Melvin? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's it kind of confirms our, our priors. Um, I, I still don't see where Melvin Gordon fits into this backfield. I, you know, he's gotten like uh, in trouble off the field. He has like you know given the ball to the other team. He has, hasn't been very good in, in Denver. Um, now he's not, you know, participating in the off season workouts. They signed Mike Boone. They traded up for Javante Williams. I, my intuition is still that I, I'm not completely sold that he's going to be on the week one roster, even though I've heard differently. And it doesn't sound like Ryan O'Halloran is, is, is I mean, he's predicting that Melvin Gordon is going to be on the team, I guess. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't see I don't see why I, I don't see why they would bring him back. Yeah, if you go back, uh, we did a YouTube show reviewing uh, subscribers' best ball draft, and we talked about how Javante would have been a really good pick from. He didn't make it back. I mean, Javante to he didn't make it back to our user in the sixth round. But man, I mean, Javante. I think by the time August comes, Javante's gonna be going in like the fourth or fifth round if this keeps up. And I think that the whispers kind of will. And then if Melvin Gordon like ends up somewhere else. Uh, Javante Williams is gonna be like a third round pick. Oh yeah, big so, time. Oh, big time. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I mean, do you are, are you sold that Melvin Gordon's gonna be there week one? Like the Broncos are just gonna guarantee his salary by keeping him on the week one roster as a vested veteran. I he seems like a guy who at the trade, at, not the trade deadline, but like around cuts, could all of a sudden end up on another team. Yeah, I don't know. I felt better about the Leonard Fournette getting cut last year. I think one thing they can do to absorb Aaron Rodgers contract if that ever goes down would be to let Melvin Gordon go and maybe that where they're waiting on stuff like that if they need the money to do it um definitely worth monitoring 
Um, something we already knew, but was also more confirmation bias. Jeff Wilson's hurt. Raheem Mostert has had nagging knee issues. Trey Sermon soaked up the overwhelming majority of first team reps for the 49ers at OTAs. Again, I would take Trey Sermon ahead of Raheem Mostert without even blinking like a full round or two ahead. I know right now their ADPs are pretty even, but I think Trey Sermon at the end of the year is very easily going to be the guy to own. And it's just good to see him getting first round, first team reps. I don't think it means a ton because most of it will be back for training camp, but it's just good to see him getting first team reps and sound like the team was reasonably happy with what they saw with him at OTA. So just wanted to note that. Yeah. A little more confirmation bias here. We're, we're big Trey Sermon supporters here. We, we love Raheem Mostert as a dude, yeah. you know, but he's best suited as a change of pace back, an explosive change of pace back. Uh, and I think it'll be a nice compliment to the bell cow, Trey Sermon. All right. Here's one we might disagree, Evan. I don't believe you have Rondell Moore. Unre- I don't believe you have Rondell Moore ranked in the top 150. Um, Larry Fitzgerald had five and a half targets per game last year in this kind of bubble screen gadgety role where the horizontal raid by the fake sharp Cliff Kingsbury just feeds targets in that role this year, I think will be Rondale Moore just soaking up five, six, seven targets per game of these short, really high completion percentage and then let him go to work. And so the reports from OTAs was Rondale Moore was the standout of OTAs for the Cardinals and whatever confirmation bias. I like Rondale Moore. That's fine. But I do think that Rondale Moore has a chance to actually have a really nice year. I think they've given up to some degree <coughs> on Christian Kirk. I think they've definitely given up on Andy Isabella. They let Dan Arnold go. There's actually more here meat on the bone than I think people realize, especially if you think AJ Green is completely done. So I would have Rondale Moore in the top 150. Uh, you don't. But he did get the positive OTA report. So checkbox for me, positive OTA report. But yeah, any thoughts on Rondale Moore? I I, I think that um, he's going to be like a little role gadget player. And I think that the, the top three receivers are going to be Hopkins, A.J. Green, and Christian Kirk. I, I'm not sold that they have given up on Christian Kirk. Um, I think that when the pads go on, that Christian Kirk is going to, um, you know, with experience in the offense, that he is going to be – more Ron, Rondell Moore, you know, he's barely played football in the last two years. Yeah. I mean, he really hasn't played a lot of football since his freshman year at Purdue. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, I'm very intrigued by him. I mean, he is, he's a little, uh, he's, he's a little stud. Yeah. Um, and, and you, if you go back and watch him when he was a freshman, albeit that was in like 2014, <laughs> uh, no, it was like 2018, but I mean, he's a lot of fun to watch, but, I think that Christian Kirk is going to go out. He's going to be the professional dude, you know, who's been there. And I think that Christian Kirk is going to have a solid season and he's going to be the Cardinal slot receiver, which is where he should have been playing for the last number of years. But Larry Fitzgerald was there and, you know, he's a legacy. He's a future hall of famer. They couldn't just pull him out and put, put Christian Kirk in. I think that Christian Kirk is going to go to training camp, have a big training camp and open the season as the Cardinal slot receiver. Okay. Interesting. We'll be watching that closely you already mentioned it on the last episode but Rashad Penny this knee thing has still been going on since I believe it was December of 2019 he blew out his knee still having problems with that right knee got to clean up on it you have Chris Carson 26th overall in that tier that I know is really tight but you have him slightly ahead of CEH Dobbins Miles Sanders David Montgomery I mean it's only a good thing for Chris Carson for Rashad Penny to have continued knee issues obviously so I just wanted to note that Gio Bernard, I think there's some question. There was some speculation, you know, uh, Gio Bernard's going to be the clear-cut third down back for the Bucks. I don't know if I buy that, but if he is, it's a real problem for Leonard Fournette and Ronald Jones because if they're not getting any of the pass down work and they're sharing the early down work, there's just not a lot of meat there. I actually think Leonard Fournette and Gio will share the pass down reps and Rojo will be strict early down. But any thoughts on how much Gio is going to play? Because I think how much Gio plays is a really big indicator of how we should be valuing Fournette and Ronald Jones. Yeah, just just a bunch of scrubs in this backfield. I mean, <laughs> just guys that, you know, they're like kind of hanging on by a thread, staying in the NFL, you know. Um, I, what, are, what are they doing with Ronald Jones? Like, give it up already, you know, enough <laughs> already with Ronald Jones. Like, can we, can we move on? Uh, I mean, he's like an okay early down runner. Well, yeah, I, I think on zero this team, value in the in the passing game on this team, though, he's their best pure runner. Ronald Jones is. I mean, it's not even a question. 
Yeah. Really? I mean, I don't know. He's about equal with Leonard Fournette. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. fine. I thought Leonard Fournette in the past game, though, like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I thought that, that, that'd that be fine. But, yeah, yeah. it's going to be a mess here. You have Fournette 92nd, Ronald Jones 117th. They should trade for Melvin Gordon and just, you know, <laughs> run out a four-way RBBC of guys that, you know, people think are good but actually suck. <laughs> wow. I'm going to send this to Kareen. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Eagles running backs coach Jamel Singleton, quote, seeks a backfield with running backs who can fill different roles and downplay the idea of an every down guy. I don't want to overreact to this because once the pads go on, Miles Sanders is so clearly their most talented back, but I think it at least leaves the light on for Kenny Gainwell to have some role and maybe some big back. I don't know which one, but one of the big backs to have a role as well. You still have Miles Sanders 29th overall. I still like Miles Sanders as just a straight bet on talent type of thing. But did that quote from Jamel Singleton give you any pause at all? on Miles Sanders. Yeah, it, it did a little bit. Um, I mean, I, I already think that because, you know, Jalen Hurts in the dual threat role, you're not going to get a lot of targets for the RBs, I don't, I don't think, uh, over the course of a full season. And then if he starts losing work to other dudes, uh, Kenny Gain- Kenneth Gainwell, it's it was surprising to me when I was looking at Football Guys Championship ADP, He's like a top 150 player in uh, Football Guys Championship ADP. Like, people are taking him, you know, he's like a popular, like, 10th round pick Mm -hmm. um, or 10th to 12th or, you know, somewhere in there. And I I mean, I don't, I couldn't justify him in in my own top 150. Like, and he's not particularly close. I mean, he's like a fifth round rookie. Like, those guys usually have to, like, compete for a roster spot. I I did, I do like it. It's incredibly rare. Yeah. It's just so rare for a fifth round rookie to have a fantasy impact in year one. Right. I mean, just, I mean, they are, they often like end up on the practice squad. Yeah. You know, I mean, so I, and and I, I I like Kenneth Gainwell, but I think that that's awfully aggressive to be drafting him. They, they just, they have a bunch of dudes there. It definitely is murky. Miles Sanders, I, I think, is clearly head and shoulders above everyone else, but he does have this concern about that he's going to lose you know peripheral touches and especially in the passing game yeah and boston scott is still there as well um okay last news thing before we get to rankings changes john gruden um singles out henry ruggs and i I thought his quote was at least somewhat interesting gruden says last year he thought ruggs did a really good job of opening up the field for others and that's always the rhetoric when these speed guys don't actually produce they say well he opened up the field for everybody else but Gruden said this year, we don't actually want to get Henry Ruggs the ball. And, I, you know, that's kind of a good idea for someone you took first wide receiver overall in 2020. You currently have Henry Ruggs 121st overall. He's going to be a player that, like, when it gets to me in, like, the 11th and 12th round, like, I'm, I kind of want to take just, like, bet on a young, exciting guy with a ton of athletic ability. I don't know if that's sharp or not, though. What do you think about Henry Ruggs? Do you believe Gruden that they're actually going to try to get him the ball this year? I, I don't believe anything that John Gruden says, um, <laughs> uh, but I, I have the exact same view uh, as you of Henry Ruggs, where, you know, you get to him like around pick 120 or whatever, and it's like he's on the board, you know, and like so is Marvin Jones, and you're like, mm-hmm. I'm definitely taking Henry Ruggs, you, right. you know, like, I'm probably going to end up with a decent amount of him. His ADP is very, very low. Um, I, I, I would I anticipate ending up with a, a decent amount of I don't know what he's going to do. His his game just doesn't really mesh with Derek Carr unless they're going to get him on the the quick hitters that they that they fed Henry Ruggs at Alabama, which is what they should do. They should go go back and watch his college tape, and and see how Alabama manufactured touches for him, and he was like an explosive, dynamic playmaker uh, when when they got the ball in his hands, and and not have him be a clear out guy. I don't know what they're going to do. But uh, I, I think I'm going to end up with a decent amount of Henry Ruggs. Yeah. Watch Henry Ruggs high school basketball tape if you want to get an idea of what kind of athleticism this dude has. Total, total freak. All right. A few quick rankings changes before we get out of there. Again, Evan did a sweep of his top 150 last week. One of the big risers was Big Mike Williams of the Los Angeles Chargers up to 89th overall now. I always like Big Mike Williams because he has a really high – a dot meaning he's deep down the field and he gets red zone chances hunter henry is gone now i like mike williams it seems like people don't want to click him very often though but what was your thinking behind giving a big bump to big mike yeah i've actually kind of been out on mike williams for the past several years um but this year i think i i, I want to be in on him because i i believe in this offense i love the aggressiveness that justin herbert wasn't supposed to have 
coming out of Oregon, but absolutely showed that he had uh, last year. And and Mike Williams, I mean, they they had chances to connect last year, and they just really they didn't they didn't they didn't get it done. Mm-hmm. But but that was also a, a situation where you know again Herbert came in with like zero practice time. They they truly planned on not starting him. Tyrod Taylor has the the fluke thing with the doctor, and Herbert comes in and. You know, they they just kind of never quite got on the same page. Throwing the ball to Keenan Allen in the middle of the field time and time again is, you know, is 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 a comfortable way to play for Justin Herbert as a rookie with you know no very little experience throwing to these guys. I think with a full off season, full training camp, um, we we might see Mike Williams' best year yet. Yeah, and I like that. And we didn't mention a Charger stack, but it's not cheap, but I do think it has a lot of upside. I like Eckler. I like Keenan. I like Big Mike. Obviously, you can get the tight ends, either Cook or Parham, very, very late. And then I actually think that the rookie that they took, Josh Palmer, will end up winning the number three wide receiver job, and he's like essentially free also. Other guy that you moved up a lot, other wide receiver you moved up a lot was Michael Gallup. We talked about him some last episode, but of this Dallas team, he is very clearly the cheapest most affordable one and Michael Gallup is still dripping with talent so I like being high on Michael Gallup for sure you have him at 88th overall right now right ahead of big Mike go ahead on Michael Gallup's move yeah and we talked about him a little bit on last on on the last on the previous show uh he came into last year with a lot of hype you know just everything worked against him and now he's the perfect post hype uh you know buy low guy um He's a baller. He's really freaking good. Even last year in like really adverse circumstances, like he popped for some big games. Um, I have him so high, so far above his ADP. I mean, it's like 17 spots among wide receivers and like 30 spots overall. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, we're like, he's going to, if you're using the rankings right now, like you are getting Michael Gallup hundred yeah. percent. It's like, like a lock. And I mean, where would Michael Gallup go right now if Dak had been healthy all of last year? I mean, Michael yeah. Gallup would probably be like a fifth or sixth round pick if Dak had been healthy for all of last year. Yeah. Yep. Last ranking exchange we're going to talk about is this mid-level tight end here. And this is more of a structural thing than a micro thing. But you made the decision to move back a lot of these mid-level tight ends. Mike Jasicki, Logan Thomas, Irv Smith, Noah Fant, Dallas Goddard, Evan Ingram, Rob Tunyon. You just made the decision to move them all back and move some other positions ahead of them I think that one thing we talked about with Leone was the gap between the elites Kittle Waller Kelsey to some of these kind of back tier guys where we're kind of stabbing is way wider than maybe it was before it sounds like you agreed with Leone what was the decision making process behind moving back the mid-level tight ends yeah because um yeah because they're they're they really almost like you could put them all into one tier it's like tight ends like it might start at Higby although I kind of love Higby. Mm-hmm. So it's probably like the, and I think I have Tyler Higby at seven right now among tight ends. Mm-hmm. So it'd be like eight through 14 and they're like almost interchangeable. So I wanted to move them down because um, in the top 150, because if you're using that to draft, like you're not going to take multiple of them and you know, and you, you, you just take one of them you, and you probably take like one of the later guys, yeah. um, you know, what, whatever, whatever uh, member of this big tier falls to you. And so it, it didn't make a lot of sense to have them. I, I moved them all like 10 spots down. Yeah. And I would say from a structural perspective, why we've been harping on taking Waller or Kittle at that two, three turn is because you, you're just crushing your opponent so hard because this gap that we're talking about here, you're rolling out Waller or Kittle every week and our opponent is running out like Evan Ingram or Dallas Goddard. It's just such a huge, huge advantage. So yeah, just to look a little bit of structural stuff there. Okay. Has not been a ton of news, has not been a ton of rankings changes, but it's going to start ramping up real fast, real soon here as we push into July and get camps opening mid to end of July. In the meantime, be head sure to head to the site to check out everything that we have for best ball for Dynasty. I know all you guys are in the streets out there. We're going to let Evan get to his yard work now for producer Luke for Evan. I am Adam. Good luck. Everybody.